Good evening, everybody. How, how are you doing? Welcome back. This is week two. I'm Daryl, and I hope you guys are doing fine. Um, I was able to get through uh, pretty much all of the, uh, the, the main assignments today for those of you that turned it in on, uh, last night or this morning. And I was very, very pleased. Most of you did really, really well. I had some that are really terrific. So uh, I think you guys are all uh, pretty sharp and on the right track. I think uh, we're gonna do some cool things. So this week we move from looking at other people's presentations to starting to make our own. Now, we're not gonna start on the main presentation this week. We're gonna start the planning part of it. So uh, this is a, a week where we deal with pre-production planning. And that's what the reading is about. Um, if you'll uh, notice in the reading, uh, we, we've now started to look at the other book, uh, Slideology. So we're going to get some chapters from that. Uh, e if any of you are still experiencing trouble with the um, uh, O'Reilly website, we have a copy of the book, Slideology, in the downloads for you. So you can read it offline if you wish. Uh, and and uh, there's still some more chapters from Resonate that we signed. This week. So this week we're, we're talking about what goes in to the pre-planning of a presentation as we're starting to put ours together. And the main assignment this week is going to be a, a planning document. It's basically the notes that you make in advance of doing your presentation. And I know that uh, maybe that's an unusual way for a lot of you to work. Maybe you don't make notes. Maybe you just jump in and start doing things. But uh, I want to be able to have a sense of, of where you're going and what you're planning to do. And so uh, we ask you to, to put these things together and uh, I'm going to go through that assignment. Uh, it's the main assignment of the week. Uh, uh, more in detail later this later today. But, um, you know, we give you a lot of flexibility in the way that you put your notes together. So it's really you just brainstorming, creating a document. Um, and in the reading, there were several uh, things that, that I wanted to touch on. One is that uh, in Slideology, Nancy Duarte makes her first pass at trying to define what's special about a presentation, about what a presentation can do that other things can't do. And the first one is one she's already you know, told us about, that you can focus in on a specific audience, that the audience is the hero, is the king, is uh, the focus of your attention. And so you don't want to make generic presentations. You want to know who you're talking to and be able to tailor your arguments, your references, your art, your language to that audience so that you have an impact uh, on a specific person that you're wanting to uh, um, impress or persuade. Um, presentations have a way of, of moving people and spreading around. So they're a viral kind of document. You can really get a lot of information to a lot of people very quickly. That's why we want presentations to be short and to the point. We don't want them to be, uh, you know, long, exhaustive documents. We want them to be something that just plants an idea and lets that idea go forward. Uh, and so they're necessarily brief. They're necessarily uh, very to the point. Uh, we want them to be visual. So even though you start off in language, even though you use your, your voice as the narrator, the slides are very important to help people see what you're saying. Uh, as they listen to you, we want them to sort of run a movie in the back of their head. And in order to help them run that movie, the visuals are incredibly helpful. They're the, one, they're the things that kind of allow the audience to key off and sort of fantasize that whatever you're talking about is happening to them. And that's why it's important to use images that communicate. We're not just making pretty pictures. We're not just filling the screen to fill the screen. We want to choose images that say something. We're practicing design, not decoration. And the final aspect of this, uh, you know, five theses is that presentation is about relationships. If you're doing it live, there's a, there's a dynamic relationship between the performer and the audience. You can actually read the audience. And if they're low energy, you can pump them up. If they're a little unruly, you can focus them in. Um, and you can actually subtly change your presentation as you're doing it if you have the ability to read the audience. 
Now we're creating offline presentations. So we have to know as much about our audience ahead of time as we can, because we can't alter it in the performance. We have to be able to make choices uh, as we're going into production and stay with them. But there's still relationships involved there. There's a relationship between the audio track, which is you telling the story, and the visual track, which is images which help people understand the story. So that dynamic tension is something that you play with as a creative artist and that you really pay a lot of attention to. The relationship between the narration and the illustration. Um, so another part of the reading this week and one of the most important things I want to go through real quick, spend a little bit of time on, is this notion of how you cre properly create a presentation. I've mentioned that um, most people do it backwards, that they start with the slides and that's what creates awful presentations. That you don't even really know what you're saying or you don't know where you're going or what the key point is and you already start making slides. So we, we very, very much want you to break that habit. We want you to start thinking from the beginning about uh, being strategic. You know, uh, you begin with the first principles. Who am I talking to? What am I saying to them? Uh, what are the elements of the story? How can I craft the story to make it more interesting? And you wanna actually get that entire narration from you uh, together before you ever start on the slides. So uh, one of the bits of reading that you have this week is Nancy talking about the presentation ecosystem. And she kind of compares it to other media arts presentations, uh, ecosystems. You're all probably very, very familiar with movie presentation, uh, movie ecosystem. It's something we've had for a hundred years. And uh, it all roughly breaks down into three parts, pre-production, production, and post-production. And in pre-production, that's where you write a script and you hire actors and you, you put the cast together and you build sets and you figure out all the problems and you schedule the shoot. And the production is shooting the film. And that's usually the most expensive part of a movie production. So you want that to be as tight and well-programmed, well-scheduled uh, as it can possibly be. You don't wanna waste time. You don't wanna waste money while you're shooting. And in the old days, is even more difficult because when you shot film, which is chemical, you wouldn't even know what you had the day that you shot it. You would shoot the film, you develop it overnight and you'd watch dailies the next day. And if you made a mistake, then you'd have to go back and reschedule shooting. Uh, nowadays, as we work digitally, we see the shot instantaneously. And if we got it right, uh, we can move on. And if we got it wrong, we can just keep working on it. So we have lots of advantages to working digitally nowadays that the old production system had to work around. And then after production, that's the assembly at time. That's when you bring in an editor. That's when you bring in sound uh, composers and, and you, you package the whole thing together. So there's that same uh, set of processes for making a presentation. Uh, Nancy defined it a little bit differently in, in her writing and, and that's what we're gonna read about this week. She defined a message track a visual story track and a delivery track. And each one of these has to be addressed, has things that have to be figured out and they all have to be done in a proper order in order for you to be able to take advantage of uh, making sure that you've addressed all these issues. And each one of these tracks has component parts. So I wanna take a minute or two just to break it down and go through it. Uh, this is gonna be in the reading so uh, you don't necessarily have to get it all for me, but I wanted to touch on it briefly. In the message track, you're figuring out what you wanna say. And the very first important point is figuring out who you're talking to. Knowing your audience, having a vision of your audience presages what you say, because you're going to design that message to convince them. And so the more you know about who they are, about what they know and what they care about and, and uh, what references would appeal to them and what references would not appeal to them, the better you can create and craft your speech. So you have to do research on who your audience is so you know enough about them so that your presentation is tailored to their needs and wants and, 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 and uh, proclivities. Uh, and then you go into an ideation phase. 
Uh, ideation is uh, a very important word that you've probably never heard. And uh, the reason is that there's this um, slang term that, that we all use instead. Um, this is a sister word to creation. You all know what creation is. Creation is the act of creating things. And ideation is the act of uh, generating ideas. And we popularly know it as brainstorming. Now, brainstorming isn't anything real. It's a metaphor. It, you know, it, 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 it hinges on the popular notion that there's some kind of meteorological uh, um, environment in your brain and that when you create a storm, when you kick up a lot of dust, new ideas happen. And the brain is still somewhat of a mystery to us. But the notion of brainstorming means that you're trying to get at ideas that you have that you don't know that you have, that they're hidden in the back of your brain. And we each have different processes we go through to generate ideas. And um, we're going to experiment with using different processes this week. Those of you that don't necessarily have a regular brainstorming or idea generating process, uh, you know, you, it, this is a good week to try some new, new things. Uh, those of you that have tried and true methods, stick with them. But I'm going to say to everyone, whatever it is you normally do in terms of brainstorming, push it a little further. That's going to be my advice to you to make you a better artist overall. Every one of you, no matter what it is you do, whatever amount of time you can currently spend in brainstorming, if you can push that a little bit more, a little bit more beyond your comfort zone, you're going to generate more and better ideas. And the more ideas you generate, the more choices you have. And uh, what we want to guard against is being lazy artists who take the first idea that comes to our head and don't push any further. Um, there's a lot of people that use Google that way. They'll search in Google and they'll just take the very first choice in Google and then they're the same as everybody else. But when you do a search in Google, there's usually 100,000 results, 800,000 results, 4.5 million results. So if you were to be a little more unique and push on and look at some of those uh, results beyond the first page, you'd find some information or you'd find some choices that are much more specific to you that would much more express who you are. And brainstorming is the same way. If you push yourself, if you generate more ideas, then that last idea isn't always necessarily gonna be the best. And I won't say that the first idea will always be terrible. But you'll never know if you don't go through the process. And you'll only be a better artist if you give yourself lots of options. And in giving yourself lots of options, quite often what happens is that you find two or three that you really like, and maybe you can't implement them all now, but you'll have, you'll have generated those ideas, you've written them down in paper or sketched them or something and memorialized them, and you can get back to them and you can try them again some other time. So, uh, the whole point of brainstorming is to get those hidden ideas out of the back of your head and into some place where you can access them whenever you need to. So after you go through a brainstorming phase and you have lots of ideas, then you start to edit that stuff. You, don't, you can't use it all. You don't want to use it all, but you want to pick and choose what it is you need to tell your story. And remember, what we want to do is take whatever we have to say and bring it into a story. That means a beginning, middle, and an end. That means you're, you're choosing details to talk about, that you're going to set up what you want to have to say, talk about the complications or, or uh, changes that have to be made, and then reach towards a conclusion at the end about how you're going to get through this material. And no matter what it is you're talking about, you can craft what you have to say into that beginning, middle, and end story. And that's going to make what you have to say much more interesting to the people who are listening. And so that's your job as a creative presenter is to figure out all this, all this uh, multiple elements that you've brainstormed, all this stuff you want to get into your presentation that's interesting. How can you put it in a form that connects, that makes people listen to it like it was a drama? And so uh, as you put your story together, you then end up writing it uh, into story form. You end up using different tools 
to move from one place to the other. You might use a sketchbook or uh, just uh, random notes to, to, to brainstorm with. Uh, and then when you're writing, you would use writing tools like Word or something like that. Uh, and then when you got into more specific uh, forms, uh, if you had to write, you know, to, to uh, uh, particular slides or counts or whatnot, you might have different kinds of tools like storyboarding and uh, uh, script writing that would be a little more formalized in writing. So as you go through the writing phase, you use different tools to get different kinds of results. Uh, but that's the message phase. The, the visual story phase has the same sort of process. You begin with generating ideas. And again, there are tools for that. You can sketch, you can use uh, software that helps you create visually. Um, we're gonna talk this week about mind maps. Uh, that's something that some of you may never have heard of before, but it may help some of you to be creative. Uh, if you're sketching in your sketchbook or um, uh, just uh, writing notes, uh, it's okay to just bring those rough notes in. Uh, sometimes if you're writing in Word, uh, there are different ways of writing in Word. You don't have to write formally in paragraphs. You can write an outline form and that allows you to have free forming notes, but somehow connect them together. Uh, and maybe you're just, will write all these abstract notes and then look for a ways to connect them together. That's something that mind maps can help you do. It can organize things in forms visually. So if you're an artist that responds visually uh, better than just simply writing, uh, you might find tools for that. Storyboarding, again, something that helps a lot of people. There are online uh, image collection tools now that uh, help people gather together the visual information they need for the presentations. Something like Pinterest, where you can create sets of images and you can use search the internet and sort of collect images in uh, um, folders or bundles that you can then get access to later on. Other forms of visual thinking that you need to go through in order to create your visual presentation is to think about what style you want to illustrate in. You know, as we talk about creating slides to match up to what we say, there's levels of sophistication there. And the level that's built into PowerPoint is very crude. That's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, uh, visual people shy away from it, that there's a lot of um, cartoon clip art in in PowerPoint. So if you're talking about a tree, I'm sure you could go in and find a cartoon image of a tree and that would work visually as you as you say tree, we see tree. But if it's a cartoon image, it might be geared more towards third graders or, or fifth graders than someone visually sophisticated. And if you're making a presentation to someone who is above your station, or is very powerful or is very visually sophisticated, you want to appeal to their sophistication. You don't want to show them that you use the lowest common denominator. You want to show them that you have a, a style that matches theirs or matches their interest or intrigue. So thinking about the way that you would illustrate something like a tree, whether it be with photography or, or art or video game art or uh, clips from movies that way express your style and perhaps connect with who your audience might be. So uh, the, the type of illustrations you use is part of the visual thinking you want to think about in the pre-production and in terms of how does it connect to the audience and what does it say about me in terms of their judging the presentation I'm putting together. Um, visual thinking also involves creating models for information. A lot of what you're going to be talking about is taking bits of information and having people think about it in particular ways. So if you can create charts and graphs or infographics that let people understand information, sometimes for the very first time in a brand new way, that's a very powerful tool. And it will mean that you'd be employed for life doing it. So being able to think about information and visualize a story or a model about it so that other people can understand very easily and quickly uh, is an important thing to be working on. Uh, you want to think about symbols. You're not all going to be graphic designers, 
but as people in the uh, media verse, you have all been messaged to 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 times in your life. You're already an expert in graphic design because people have been practicing it upon you. And so just think about how graphic design works in terms of getting you to understand something very quickly, making sure that something is um, clean and direct, you know, that the text has contrast and, and uh, isn't uh, uh, confusing, that you're using fonts that people can understand very quickly. Um, your presentation is going through time. Your slide is gonna be up for seconds. Maybe it's only up for two seconds. Maybe it's up for 18 seconds, but the quicker people look at your slide and understand exactly what you have to say, the better off you are. And uh, the analogy that I like to throw up to people is, imagine the signage that goes on on the side of a highway. You're driving along that highway at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. And if there's a sign on the side of the road, it's information you need to have. And you need to be able to, be, to read it as you're going by that fast. So nobody uses weird German Gothic fonts or crazy backgrounds or patterns. Signage on a highway is very clean and clear. You have heavy fonts that are very readable against a, a contrasty background. You don't use more words than you have to. You use symbols when you can. All of this stuff is for you to be able to read and understand something very quickly. And you can apply these same principles to slide design. The faster somebody understands what your slide says, the less time they're gonna take away from listening to you to interpreting the slide. Mm -hmm. If you give someone a complex photo collage as a, as a slide, they may take 10 or 15 seconds to decipher it, to pick it all apart. And that's all time that they're not listening to you. So uh, those of you who have a pattern of, of taking nine photos and putting them on one slide and holding on that slide for a minute, that's terrible slide design. Take those nine slides and put uh, nine images and put them on nine different slides and spin them through time with each of them getting their own moment to be understood. And, and very ideally being connected in time to what you're saying on the voiceover track. This is what you want to be using your slides for. Uh, so you wanna separate information, you wanna keep it clean, you want people to be able to interpret things very quickly and you move on. Motion design is very important, it's part of the message. Now, when I talk about motion design, I'm not talking about the gazillion transitions that are built into PowerPoint. The transitions that Microsoft gives you in PowerPoint are things that happen between your content. You create the slides and Microsoft creates the transitions. If they're spending all their time looking at fancy transitions, they're not looking at your slides. So I don't want you to use those fancy transitions. I want you to use simple transitions like cuts and slides and pushes and dissolves. Something that gets you very quickly from slide to slide. So what is the motion design that I want you to use? Well, I want you to always think about trying to keep people in the moment. So for instance, while I don't want you to completely lard up your presentation with bullet points, there could certainly be a time in your presentation in which you might need to take five different uh, statements and put them together as bullet points because they belong together. But if you brought that slide in fully formed as five bullet points, the audience would immediately try to read all of that information and they'd stop listening to you. When, since you're in control of this presentation, you can start that slide on a blank screen and slide in point one, right as you begin talking about it and not bring in uh, point two until you begin talking about it, six seconds later or eight seconds later, et cetera. So as you're talking about these five points, you can bring them in one at a time. That has the, added advantage of keeping the audience in the moment. They're never trying to read ahead. They're never trying to catch up. They are in the moment listening to you and seeing the information right in front of them. So motion design has the ability to guide the reader through the visuals and keep you in command of their attention. So this is all very important. The way that you bring things up, the speed at which you move, you wanna have tempo, 
You don't want to have too fast or creative, crazy a tempo. So you don't want to move too slowly. You don't want to bore them. And certainly, uh, as a general rule, don't hang on any particular slide any longer than 20 or 25 seconds. You know, if you create one slide and hang on it for, for two minutes, that's not really a presentation. So make sure that you're creating multiple slides and you're moving through them at a pace that makes the audience feel comfortable. The last leg of the uh, uh, in, environment is the delivery system. How are people going to see your presentation? We've defined presentation very broadly, and I want to continue defining it as broadly as I can. I keep saying the word PowerPoint, but I don't really mean only PowerPoint. You can make presentations in video editing uh, uh, processes. You can make them with uh, uh, podcasting tools. You can use any kind of different uh, material and there are lots of online softwares as well. We're going to explore a lot of those uh, to, to make presentations. So PowerPoint is by no means the only way to create a presentation. It's just simply the most popular at this point. But you have to think about how is the audience going to receive this? We've already determined that what we're not doing this month in our class is live presentation. The human element. This is the most important thing to think about. If you're actually delivering a presentation live, then what are the circumstances? We just watched a whole lot of TED Talks. And so those were people standing on a stage, addressing an audience that was sitting in theater chairs, all pointed, aimed at them. That's an ideal situation for maintaining everyone's uh, attention. But that's not really the common way that people do presentations. The most common way people do presentations right now is in a conference room. You're in a business and you're, you have a problem and, and you schedule a meeting for a week from now on Tuesday and you know, there's an hour and someone has to get up and start that meeting and they usually start that meeting with a presentation of PowerPoint. Now, the meeting probably isn't scheduled to last more than an hour because everybody's busy and you have to create a, you have to reach a conclusion, you have to fix this problem. So the presentation shouldn't run an hour, the presentation should run four minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, just to set everything up. The whole point of the presentation is to clarify everyone's thought and start a basis of discussion so that you really get to an answer right away in that one hour's conference meeting. So what are those circumstances? You're in a conference room, uh, maybe it's got a big giant table around it, maybe there's six or eight people seated around it. The six or eight people at the meeting are all representing different departments that you have to convince, maybe there's a money person, maybe there's a, a, a project manager who's concer concerned about the, the schedule, maybe there's a, a, um, a pr programmer who's wor worried about uh, whether it's challenging or interesting enough, maybe there's an artist pr uh, person who's worried about how many artists it's gonna take to create the work that you're talking about. You have to address the concerns of everyone in the room and you have to know who they are. So that kind of presentation typically happens you know, you're at the table, maybe you're presenting it from a laptop that you've laid on the table. Maybe your laptop or your iPad uh, is projecting to a, uh, uh, a monitor on the wall and everybody's watching it that way. But that is a short circumstance where you're close enough to see everyone in the eye. You probably already know who these people are or you should know who they are. And it is a different kind of presentation than the TED Talk type of standing in the um, uh, auditorium. Uh, and then there's also one-on-ones. You know, uh, an elevator pitch is a type of presentation. You suddenly meet someone and you have 30 seconds to talk to them and tell your, your ideas. You're not gonna have slides. You're not gonna have a PowerPoint that you can hit, but you might, also, you might wanna already have the pitch for your great idea that you're, you're ready to you know, give to Elon Musk when you accidentally meet him in an elevator. So figuring out how to talk to humans is very important. If you're not going to be there in person, having a human connection is the most important thing. And so we've determined that for this presentation that you're all creating, your voice is all important. Everybody has to provide a voiceover. There won't be any exceptions. Everybody has to have a voiceover in their presentation. You have to speak it, you have to record it, you have to add it to the presentation. Now, you may have qualms about speaking aloud, 
but at least there won't be any performance qualms. You don't have to have anyone watching you. You have the ability to record this audio completely on your own and you can record it over and over again until you're happy. So no one can see you fail. You get to keep doing it until you like it, but you're going to have to pick one of the audio uh, tracks that you created and put it on that uh, presentation and attach visuals to it. That is the way that we're creating presentations for this class this week, this month. So the human connection is important. Now, in addition to your voice, you may actually want to be on camera. You may actually want to use your webcam and therefore your face can be on camera and people can see you and you have eye contact and you have hand gestures that you can use. And so there's more parts of human contact that you can use to communicate with and you can think about those things. But the minimum for everyone is going to be your voice. So you need to think about how to use your voice and how to persuade people with your voice. And then the condition of delivery. If we're not gonna be doing this live, how are people gonna be receiving this? Are you creating a YouTube video that's gonna be on the internet? Are you sending someone a, a, a disc or a, a, a file? Uh, is this a, a PowerPoint file that they're gonna play in their software? Is this something that plays on, on the web or, or uh, through uh, some other kind of device? Um, the conditions of viewing are things that you need to be thinking about. And another aspect of the conditions of viewing are uh, what you see as a creator. Most of you are gonna be working on your laptops. Those are 13 or 15 inch screens. So the slides that you're looking at are going to be filling that screen. Do they scale down? If the person who's watching your presentation is gonna end up watching your presentation on their phone, will the slides still look good down at three to four inches across, scaled down from the size of your laptop? Maybe you go in the other direction. Maybe the person viewing it is gonna watch it on a, a large screen TV, you know, a 55, 60 inch television. Are your images gonna scale up? Have you chosen high quality enough images that they will scale? These are things to think about in pre-production because that's your problem. Those are your issues. And you don't wanna discover the problems after the fact. You wanna deal with the problems before they become problems. So thinking about it, solves those issues, figuring out what elements or what devices people are going to be used to, to view your presentation can tell you what the circumstances of viewing are going to be and uh, um, what to plan for. And know that it, as we go into the future, there are going to be all kinds of new devices that you'll have to plan for. There are going to be interactive televisions, there's going to be augmented reality, there's going to be virtual reality. We don't know exactly what all the technology coming up is going to be, but know that as a designer, as a, as a presenter, as a creative artist, you're gonna have to roll with these punches. You're gonna have to be thinking about this. And as you're creating presentations in the here and now, it's a good idea to keep an idea, uh, one eye on where technology is going, just to be able to future-proof yourself. You know, um, we've all been making presentations in high def, and by high def, you know, if we're talking in television terms, that means 720p or 1080 uh, uh, as a size. And yet, meanwhile, we've been buying all these phones and the phones have 4K video on them. What does 4K video mean? It means that it's twice the size of a 1080p high def video. So we're already shooting video in our phones that is bigger than fits on a television. And that may get larger and larger. And as we go into the future, we may need that resolution or we may not need that resolution. One of the issues you're gonna to have to deal with as a, a, a production artist is knowing that if you're using really high, high quality images, they take up a lot of space. And sometimes it takes a long time to render, it takes a long time to upload. It makes uh, your job more difficult when you didn't need something to be that big. So just thinking about your materials is part of your job. The last aspect of uh, delivery is something that uh, um, sounds funny. We call it paper. Uh, the, the, new, the new way to think about it is, is perhaps leave behind. And the idea is that a presentation only happens in time and it ends. It, however long the presentation is, it's going to end. So if you do a great job 
And let's say you're in a, a TED Talk type atmosphere. You're on a stage, you're presenting to a, a great audience. They're in theater seats, they have all your attention. You're giving them a great presentation for a new product or a cause or something that you want them to all join. And when that presentation ends, what happens after that presentation ends? That's what the leave behind is about. You need to be able to figure out how to put into the hands of your audience some way to continue the conversation. If this were a live event, maybe you're handing out business cards or brochures based on the design of your presentation, but something that people will take with them. I don't know how many people make presentations and they think that if on the very last slide they put their phone number or their email or their uh, Instagram handle, that that's how people are going to get a hold of you. But it's a hundred percent guaranteed that whoever is watching your presentation is not going to get out a pen and paper and write that down. So putting that information on the last slide of a presentation doesn't get it into the hands of your audience. You have to figure out how to do that. So if you're delivering your presentation digitally, then we don't need paper anymore. We don't need to put something physical in people's hands, but you need to figure out how to continue that conversation. What is the Chrome around the presentation you're presenting? Are you, are you putting on a YouTube page? Is there a link on that YouTube page that they can get to you? Is, are you putting it on your own web page? Is there information on the, on that web page that they can continue? How did, if you've persuaded them with your presentation, how can you get them to say yes? How can you get them to, to call you or to email you or to somehow continue that conversation? That's part of your job to figure it out because you don't want to make a great presentation and then have no way for people to, to tell you yes. So that is the ecosystem. Each time, each phase of that area, you have the ability to, to ask yourself, am I doing this right? Is, can I make this better? Does it fit in with everything else? And if you ask yourself all those questions, then you have no regrets after you finish the final product. So it's important to go through this process um, so that you're asking yourself the right questions and you're not missing something uh, at the end after you've turned it in. And uh, that's something that I need you to be thinking about. So uh, this week's assignment is going to involve you guys brainstorming ideas for your presentation and their actual rules or guidelines for presentations. So I want to go through that real briefly. So uh, in, the, in the rules for presentation, Rule number one is postpone and withhold your judgment of ideas. Don't stop too soon, just keep going. As soon as you get an idea, say, okay, that's great, can I get another one? And the whole point of brainstorming is to generate a lot of ideas. And encourage, rule number two, encourage wild, exaggerated ideas. Something about the notion of coming up with something crazy means that the reaction to that, in terms of loosening stuff in the back of your mind, is that it, it, it genders better ideas in response. So you're trying to think of uh, exaggerated, crazy solutions in brainstorming in order to have a kind of snapback reaction that is much more subtle and refined. And sometimes the, the exaggerated crazy idea is the thing that can be refined and, and uh, goes beyond um, what you ever thought you could, you could imagine. Rule number three, Quantity counts at this stage, not quality. So I keep emphasizing, don't stop too soon. And what is too soon? Well, whatever your normal process is, go beyond it. If you normally spend five minutes doing this, spend seven or eight. If you normally spend 20 minutes doing this, push it to, to 20 or five or 30 minutes. The more you can extend your brainstorming process, the more you're gonna have ideas that you never thought you could have before. Now, these last two ideas are not going to be uh, relevant to you in this week because you're working alone. But eventually, you're going to be part of a creative team. If you get a job in the industry, you're going to be part of a creative team. And these last two rules are for working in teams. Rule number four, build on the ideas put forth by others. When you brainstorm as a team, somebody might say something and then you might spit out a version of that that's slightly different. And the slightly different is a relevant take on what's going on. And someone else might spin out a version of what you said. Same thing goes. 
And what's important to remember is that you're not in competition with anybody when you're brainstorming as a team. Only the team wins. So it's not about who said what. It is about can the team generate the winning idea. And along with that, rule number five, every idea and every person has equal worth. So when you first start working at a creative company, if there's one of these group brainstorming sessions, this is your chance to, to you know, prove your equality to, to everyone else in the room. If you have the best idea, that's gonna surface to the top. You may or may not get credit for it, but you will know that you contributed to that whole. And uh, at, at, at the right place, everyone's gonna value everyone's ideas. That's just a hallmark of professionalism. So all of this means that brainstorming is an important thing. It's a regular process and you should incorporate it into what you do. So that's what some of the reading's about. Uh, this week I wanna talk about uh, the discussion. This week's discussion is somewhat different from last week. Last week we had you create an initial written post. This week's initial post is going to be audio. So uh, let me get into that and, and talk to you about it. This is called the storyboard storytelling discussion. And, you, and uh, your job here is to find a professional video and then explain it. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna post a link of something that you is out on the internet. So it needs to be something that you can grab the link from. This is most likely you're going to be grabbing something from YouTube, but you can grab it from a company's webpage if you want it or whatnot. But the first thing I want you to do is watch uh, uh, another TED Talk uh, Julian Treasure, how to speak so that people want to listen. Julian Treasure is talking about how you actually believe people, how people become authentic speakers. And he posits a notion of something that he calls HAIL, H-A-I-L. HAIL stands for honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love. And he is, 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 letting us know that when you speak from the heart, when you speak the truth to other people, people will hear it in your voice. Now that's not to say that there aren't people who can convincingly lie, but for the most part, we all have trouble lying. We all have trouble sounding convincing to other people when we know we aren't telling the truth. And so when you are telling the truth, it's important that you use your voice to be as authentic and true as possible. And that's how you connect with other people people will hear it in your voice. And so um, we want you to think about hail, practice hail, and discover it in one of the videos that you're gonna to bring to us. Um, now the hail involves, there's another aspect of what he talks about. And, and if you wanna to talk to people in ways that connect and seem truthful, then you want to actually use your voice kind of as an instrument. You're not gonna talk the same way all the time. You're gonna talk differently for different effects. Um, and this is what he calls the vocal toolbox. These are simple things, you probably already know them, but you haven't really been practicing them yet. But um, the idea is that if you speak fast, if you talk fast, it sounds like you're excited. That the notion of speaking fast has an emotional appeal to it. It brings with it excitement, it brings with it uh, anxiousness, you know, if you want to convey those emotions, you will talk fast. Conversely, talking slow means that you're being thoughtful, that you're possibly being sad or ponderous. So you can convey emotions just by speeding up or slowing down your voice. You can talk in different kinds of phrasings. Um, you can have different kinds of pauses. You can certainly have dramatic pauses that create an empty space in the air. So you can use your voice in different ways. The vocal toolbox is telling us about this. I want you to think about that as you're going to create uh, a piece to upload to the discussion board. So the assignment this week is that we want you to choose a video, it's right here, choose a video that was created for consumers in the entertainment, media, arts, uh, or, or technology industry. This is a promotional video. Find a company video, find a professional video 
I don't really want private videos. I want things that were made by great corporations. So, you know, Nike commercials, uh, Apple, uh, you know, here's a Nike commercial linked here. Here's an Apple presentation. Um, something that was uh, uh, the, introduce, the introduction of a video game at the, uh, um, the, the, the game conferences and so forth. So professional presentations where people are inventing, pro, uh, bringing in products, in, in, in that video, they're telling you about it. We don't want you to use really, really long videos. So try to make them 20 minutes or less. They don't necessarily have to be commercials. Commercials are like 30 or 60 seconds. Uh, but that works great as well. But when you found the video that you want to link, I want you to link that into your discussion. And then I want you to create a uh, one to two minute audio piece in which you tell us, explain the story or message of the video, a brief summary of what's going on. Tell us, does the audience, does the video inspire or motivate the audience and tell us how. So what is it they're doing there? and describe the ways in which there's hail going on there, that there's honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love being expressed in the presentation of that video. So we want you to find a commercial video, uh, technological um, introduction, and uh, you know we're gonna give you more examples if we can. Um, and you, you wanna bring us the link to that external file and you want to add your own audio file. So how do you create an audio file? Well, there's a couple of choices here. You can use your computer, you can use your phone. If you use your computer, uh, there's usually a microphone built into your laptops. Um, there is software we recommend to everyone uh, on a laptop called Audacity. This is open source software that allows you to just simply record. And as you're recording, you can see the voiceover sample and you can do all kinds of easy things with it and you can export it just as well. So you can export the file as different file types. So what we want you to do is we want you to create an MPEG-3 or an MPEG-4 audio file and upload it to the, to the website. Um, and Audacity is free software. It's available. Uh, save changes, no. Audacity is available uh, for the Mac or the PC and it's free. It's open source software. I'm going to put the link in the discussion board here and I'm also going to put it in the, uh, I'll, I'll link it into this, to the discussion boards um, uh, after this talk is over. But uh, every one of you can just download it. You can download a version for the Mac or you can download a version for the PC. Uh, there's a Linux version, but I don't expect anybody here to be on Linux. But this is a laptop level software. And you can see that it, it's visually oriented. Uh, it, it makes editing easy. It makes converting files fairly easy, et cetera. The other way that you can do it is to use your phone. Everyone's smartphone has a really great microphone built into it. So you can use your phone to record the audio. Uh, most, audio most smartphones have uh, an accessory in them called voice memo, which allows you to just you know, like make notes for yourself. And that creates an audio file that you can then upload. You can email it, you can upload it to different websites, et cetera. So the iPhone certainly has um, uh, one called Voice Memo, and there are plenty of, of um, apps for the Android that you can get in, in the Google Play Store that will do the same thing and that they're all free. Now, when you record with your phone, you're going to talk a little bit differently than you talk on the phone. When you, when you talk to someone on the telephone, you have the phone right next to your face. So the microphone is really only one or two inches away from your mouth. And you, we, we talk in a lower voice. You know, we don't want to, we don't want other people to hear our conversations if we're out and about in the public or whatnot. So we have a phone voice and it's not a whisper, but it's a little bit of, uh, just a little bit above a whisper. And that's not your true voice. So I want to hear your room voice when you tell, tell us uh, this one or two minute presentation. So the way you deal with that is that you just hold the phone a little bit further away from your face. When you speak, the wind comes out of your mouth at a certain power. And when you speak louder, 
power is greater. You don't want to have the microphone too close or it over modulates the sound. So if you speak in the normal room voice, then if you're using your audio phone, if you're using your smartphone, you want to hold it about four or five inches away from your face. That'll be the correct distance to get about the right power that you're speaking. Likewise, on a laptop, you have to figure out where your microphone is on your laptop. For most of you, the microphone is up at the top of the keyboard on the lower part of the keyboard. So it's, at, it's right at the bottom of the monitor where the hinge is. It's right in that space between the keyboard and the monitor. And that means that if you're sitting at a desktop upright, you're about 30 inches away. That's a little bit far away. So if you want to record on the microphone on your computer, I want you to lean in a little bit. You don't need to be four or five inches away. You could be, you could be 10 or 15 inches away, but that's a little bit closer than the way you normally sit. So just make sure that you're close enough to that microphone that you're getting a good recording. And then those of you that have external microphones, that's even better. Those are higher quality. I'm using an external microphone right now. A lot of you have gaming microphones. If you're, if you're a normal gamer and you're using a headset and you have a microphone attached to that, that's already sort of set up to get your normal voice. So you should be able to get a decent recording with that. Uh, but um, we just want to be able to hear you and hear the tones of your voice. But I want you to speak for a minute or two, and I want you to answer these three questions. Explain the story of your chosen video, tell us if it inspires and how, and talk about the ways that Hale is employed in that video. And so if we go to the discussion board itself, you'll see that I have actually placed an example here. And so my example, I have a, um, a Gillette ad. I'm gonna open it up in another window here right now. Masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. What I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. boys will be I'll let you watch the whole thing on your own. It's linked in here, but you can kind of get the gist. Gillette, a company that sells razor blades, is selling their product, but they're also using the great advantage they have of being, of having access to the public's airwaves to promote a message. This is an anti-bullying message. And so uh, the presenter here has created a two minute piece talking about that. I have chosen the toxic masculinity ad by Gillette that aired about two years ago. This was right in the heart of the me. And again, I'll let you listen to all of that on your own. I don't need to, we don't need to all sit here and, and listen right now. It's, it's linked in the discussion board so you can all do it on your own time. But that's an example of what I'm looking for for you. And this is an example of how an MPEG-3 will play within the discussion board. So if you, if you create an MPEG-4 audio, it actually will come in as a, uh, an attachment. It's still playable, but if you create an MPEG-3, you can drag and drop it. And if we look here at the post here, if I, uh, it, once you start typing, you have several media files available to you at the far end. The last one is the audio file. And this will take MPEG-3 files. It won't take an MPEG-4, but it'll take an MPEG-3 file and it will upload it and play it back in this interface. So this is very useful. So if you create an MPEG-3 file, you can have your audio play in line like this. If you create an MPEG-4 file, it will simply play back as an attachment, which works just fine. Everyone can click on it and they'll hear it immediately and it'll still perform the same function. So if you create an MPEG-4 file, you're gonna drag it here to the drag and drop like an attachment file. So those are the two ways that you're gonna upload your audio. Now, to upload a link, you need to find the file that you want. So if for instance, uh, we're going to, 
uh, YouTube. And uh, here's, a, here's a file. I'm not even paying attention yet, but you have two ways of linking this. The first way is to grab the URL from the regular web page. So if I copy this and come back here, I can post it now. Note that when I post a link in here, it doesn't automatic, automatically become a link. That's just the way our discussion board is. But what you can do is post the link, then select it, and then come to this tool that says link insert link and you can post the URL again right there and then you have the option of having it open in a new tab and now when I post this I have a link that opens in a new tab now uh, the other way to link is for the sharing tool if you hit share embed, you get an embed code. And if you copy that embed code, note that I did, I hit the share button below uh, the YouTube button. I hit embed, I copy all of the embed code. And now if I come back to the file, I'm going to edit this here. So uh, instead of a, a link, I'm going to come down here and there is a, a tool called embed. If I choose embed and I paste the, paste the embed code in there, I'm now playing my video online. So you have both options are ways that you can link in. Uh, and if you simply do the link and don't make it active, that's fine. I can come back and, uh, and, and help people do it. And other people can actually still link on it and uh, uh, through their own, own browsers can go to that website. So uh, make sure you get the, the correct link in there. But uh, if you can't make it active, it's okay. Uh, there's other technology that we can use to make uh, presentations. And one of the ones that we're recommending is something called Adobe Spark. So if you don't want to download Audacity, which may be uh, more than a lot of you want to handle, Adobe Spark is an online presentation tool that records audio for you. So you can then record the audio there and then import it back into the discussion board here. So uh, that's the assignment. We, your initial post is going to be uh, an audio file with a link to the original. And then we want you to um, uh, come back during the week and comment on other people's files as text replies. So you have you have an initial post that's due on Thursday. We want you to we want you to try to get this done on Thursday. And by Sunday, I want you to come back, watch what other people have posted, reply to them, and reply to two or more people. And uh, it, those will be text replies. So uh, before I go on, do we have some questions here? You can type in the chat or you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask a question if you like. Anybody got any questions for me? If not, I'm gonna be available all week. So I'll be around. I'm gonna be helping people out in the discussion board. So uh, if you come to an issue, uh, just shoot me a, a question real quick. Not a problem at all. But I think you'll find this a really interesting challenge. Uh, and I think that uh, you, your classmates are gonna find really interesting material to bring to you in terms of the videos that they link to. So the main project, which we've alluded to, is the planning project for your presentation. Uh, we have not yet told you what your presentation is about. So this is the point where I want to do that. Um, the plan uh, or the, the, the plan that you're creating is for a presentation that you're going to create for about yourself and about your skills 
for a future employer after you graduated. So the point of the discussion or the point of the presentation that we're making this month is that you're going to imagine that you've graduated from full sail. You're going to project yourself all the way through your term here and imagine that you've learned all the things that you've come here to learn and that you've done portfolio work and you have a resume, uh, you know, portfolios, a material to show and you're ready to go to your dream employer and ask for your dream job. Now, some of you may want to work other jobs right after graduation before you go to your dream job. Some of you might just graduate and decide to go straight to it. But your job is your, your job in this week's assignment is to create a plan for that presentation that I want you to make next week. So there are a, a number of things that we want you to put in that plan. The very first thing in that plan is to identify who your target audience is. Now, note your target audience is the ideal company that you want to employ you. The presentation you're going to make is a conversation that you have three to four minutes long with your dream employer. You've, you've got the chance to work for the company you've always wanted to work for. And each one of you, it's going to be different. Whether it's Google or Apple or Pixar or Blizzard or Sony Records, whoever you want to work for, ESPN Sports, this is your chance to speak to them, tell them all you've learned, tell them who you are. You need to tell them your story. You need to tell them what you're all about, what your values are. You need to tell them what your skills are, how you gain those skills, etc. And you're telling a story, remember. So we want to know what are you going to put in the beginning, middle, and end. This is notes for the presentation you're going to make next week. So that's the job of research that you have this week. You need to figure out who you want to seek a job from and learn as much about them as you can and be as specific as you can. I don't want you to say, I wanna work for a production company. I want you to find a production company that you have in mind. You, you have to name somebody, you have to have one physical person. It can't be an abstract idea. And so some of you, that's going to be some research. And I want you to talk about how you are related to that company. You love their products. You admire their values. You feel like your work fits in with theirs. You're going to figure out a way to talk to them so that you're going to create a call to action at the end. The very end of your presentation needs to be you, you talking directly to your dream company, asking them for a job, telling them you've seen all the skills that I have. Now, this is an act of imagination. You're imagining at least 30 months into the future, maybe further. So you're gonna be able to talk about things that you know that you don't know now, work that you've done that you haven't done yet. This is an act of imagination. So, uh, make sure that it's realistic, but make sure that it follows in the path of what you want to do. And all the ideas of what you're going to put in, what you're going to talk about as your beginning, who you are, how did you begin to become interested in your chosen subject? What adventures did you have? Um, a lot of you are going to have parts of your life story that are, that are way different from everybody else. Some of you joined the army. Some of you got married and had kids and you know, worked for 30 years before you came back and started to change your career. So whatever has gone into making you who you are, that's part of the story that you're telling. The middle is how did you acquire these skills? If you're a musician, maybe you started playing at an early age, maybe you were in the band, maybe you formed a band and you toured a little. All the things that gave you experience and confidence. And then very much in this middle section is going to be what you learned at Full Sail. I want you to talk about your Full Sail education as if you'd already taken it. I want you to pick out one or two classes and talk about what you learned from them. Don't just name drop classes, talk about what you learned from them. Now, every one of you has the ability to know what classes you're going to be taking. If you've never done this before, you can go to the Full Sail website 
the regular fullsale.edu website. And um, somebody, just somebody who's got a degree program they're in, type the degree program. I'm going to show you how to find that uh, um, scheduled curriculum. Game development. Okay, I'm going to go with game development. So here I go to the degree programs. I go to games. And I see that I have a game development bachelor's. So I select game development bachelor's. And I come down here and there's both an online and a campus version. So I'm going to choose the 29 month online version course schedules. You saw how I got here. Uh, I went through the degree program. I selected game development. And now I'm choosing the online version. And lo and behold, here are all the classes that I'm going to be taking in the next 29 months. You guys are in month one. You're taking creative presentation. It's true so far. So this, these are the classes that you're going to be taking. Now, I don't want you to name drop every single class, but I want you to pick one or two classes that were incredibly relevant in your development and talk about them and tell us what you learned from it. So it's important that you do the research and you discover what classes you're going to take so you'll be able to talk about them. So all of this is in terms of putting together what we're calling the planning document. It's basically notes for your presentation. I know a lot of you don't yet work in a, a formalized habit enough where you're used to making these notes. And so it's going to feel uncomfortable. But that's a great habit to start because this is the best way to work. So I want you to make rough notes. There is no formal structure of what you have to put here. This can be just isolated elements. It can be something that's written up formally. It can be sketches. It can be uh, something out of your notebook. Um, if you're writing something by hand, I have to be able to read your writing. But uh, I want to show you some examples of the kinds of things people are turning in. So here we have someone who's written using Word and using outline form. So their target audience, they want to work for HBO. And they're telling me who the head of HBO is and what they know about them. They're talking about, you know, what your main skill is, what your brand is. Here's the elements of your story. Yeah, as a kid, I used to play with action figures. And, and so there are elements here of the story he's going to tell. And they're all isolated. But they're, they're then is separate bullet points organized by the categories that I ask you to organize them for. for. Uh, remember here, we want beginning, middle, and end. So that's the organizing principle that you're going to put here. And uh, this has all the information that I'm looking for here. It's a, it's a, a, a word outline. Now here's someone who writes in paragraph form. They want to work for Netflix. So they're just written paragraphs, but it's the same thing. True message is about what your brand is, who you are, and what you want to become. Beginning, middle, and end. This is the story of your life, the elements that you're going to put in. Star moment. You all read about star moment last week. What is something you're going to put in your presentation that's really going to, to, to grab people's imagination? What are you thinking about? Here's a person who wants to be a graphic designer for Disney. So she decided to make her presentation an example of her skill. She used graphic design and she put this into a very clean format, but she's given me exactly the information I want. Her qualifications, the beginning, middle and end, uh, her brand, uh, who she wants to work for, what she knows about Disney, what she thinks about Disney. Now this is what we call a mind map. A lot of you work visually and so uh, a word outline might feel constrictive to you. Well, this is the same as a word outline, although it's all information in a different point. This person wants to be a concept artist for Blizzard. So here's elements on the target audience. This is what she knows about Blizzard and things she wants to say. This is about what her brand is, what is, uh, you know, uh, what she wants to be as a concept artist. Here are elements of her story, the beginning, middle, and end. So all of those separate points that we asked for, she's put here. Here's what might be in her star moment. So she has, um, given me all the information I want. She's just put it in a visual form that feels more comfortable for her. So there's mind mapping software that you can use that maybe is more comfortable for you to, to write in. 
And again, uh, some people use sketches. Um, uh, here's a fellow who used uh, uh, post-its on a wall. And because I can read his writing, I'm happy to accept this. Now, if you want to give me something from your sketchbook, make sure I can read it. If you think I can't read it, then I absolutely cannot read it and I'm going to need you to retype it. But if it's legible, I'm, I'm happy for you to give me a, just a digital scan of something that you did offline. If you want to, if you want to sketch on paper or uh, write in a notebook, um, if that's the way that you brainstorm, so be it. But I want to get an idea of your process. I want to get an idea of what are the elements that you're going to be putting in. And so as you look at the assignment, make sure that all of these uh, uh, bolded points have information on them. I want you to tell me your target audience. I want to tell, tell me what your brand or big idea is. Tell me what your beginning, middle, and end is. Tell me what your star moment is going to be. I want you to give me information on each of these points. That's what I'm looking for as a, um, a plan. You've got all week to work on it. There's no point in turning it in early. I don't want anybody to start on their presentation until you get feedback from me on the plan. So uh, do some research. Think about the classes you're going to be taking. Think about the portfolio work you might want to show them. And again, if you haven't created this portfolio work yet, if you are wanting to be a game artist and you know that going through full sale, you're going to make a test game with a group of kids, maybe you can invent a game that you can talk about in past tense. And maybe you can find some information, make some artwork on the internet that you can use to illustrate it just enough to put the idea across. Any images that you gather from other sources, I want you to credit those sources, but you have the right to take other people's artwork and claim that it's yours for the purpose of this presentation because this is an act of imagination. We're talking about where you're going to be, not where you are right now. So I don't want anybody to talk in the present tense. I want you to talk about that time past graduation where you're going for your dream job. All right, any questions about this? If this is for the presentation next week, is the final week going to be a new presentation? No, the final week is a chance to revise that presentation based on feedback. So everyone plans the presentation this week. They build the entire presentation next week. Next week is not about Building a half-assed version with something missing, I want a complete presentation. And you're going to have time to get it done. But then once I have that presentation, I'm going to give you feedback. And you're going to consider that feedback. And then you have a chance to go back and you make that presentation even better. So you're going to make a 2.0 version of the presentation that you create on week three. You're not doing a new one. You're doing a revised version based on feedback. You're also going to get feedback from your classmates. So uh, the more feedback you get, the more ideas you'll have for, for changing it and making it better. Great question. Anybody else? Um, I actually do have a question. Sure. Go ahead. Um, for the, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the audio discussion that we're supposed to do on one of the professional ads. Yeah. Um, is there anything you would like us to stay away from ad wise uh, talking about or no? Uh, I'd like you to stay with um, major brands. Uh, if you want to get off brand, it's okay. But, um, and, and a lot of you like love indie record or in, indie bands or, you know, things like that. But if you're really obscure, it's going to be harder for other people to relate to them. And I'd like you to be not controversy free, but don't dive headfirst into a controversy. If, if, if you see a discussion that you know is a red flag uh, and you could, make, you could pick another choice, that would be better. Um, we, don't want to, we don't want to back away from, from you know, discussions of, of current issues, but we don't want to pick anything that's intentionally inflammatory. Okay. I hope that was uh, a positive statement and not a spooky one. Oh, no, that was, that was okay. That was okay. All right. Anybody else? If this is for the presentation next week, is 
the final week going to be a new president. We, I, I just asked them, maybe, uh, are you, if I wanted to make a mind map, do you know of a program I can use? Uh, yes. And in fact, I will send out tomorrow morning a, an announcement with uh, a list of, of several um, uh, really great programs. I'll mention their names if you want to look them up now. On a Mac, Mind, uh, Mind Node, and on a PC, Coggle. Uh, but there are other programs that are out there that are, that are really good, but I think that uh, those are probably the two best, Mind Node and Coggle. Uh, and uh, I will have links up so that you can uh, see them. Yeah, that's the correct spelling of Coggle. Um, so uh, they give you that kind of visual map. Uh, there are more simple maps. Uh, there's a, uh, one that, that's popular in, in high school or grade school or high school called Poplet, which gives you like just generic bubbles, uh, but you can't put as much information in it. So uh, a good mind map is gonna allow you to write as much or as little in each point as you can, because you don't wanna be, you don't, you don't want to be um, stifled to buzzwords. I, you know, if there's information to be given, I want you to give that information. That's, that's exactly what I'm asking for. So don't let the mind map force you into just the uh, buzzwords and stuff. Uh, okay, yeah, you, so you're, in, you're familiar with that one. So uh, there are a number of, of, of um, uh, mind mapping programs out there and uh, you know they, they all offer their own uh, look and feel and you know that's really what this is about is finding something that you feel comfortable with that allows you to be uh, creative in your own way. So uh, any more questions? If not I'm gonna let you guys go um, and uh, I think everybody's doing really well and I think uh, we're gonna have uh, some really interesting uh, posts this week so I'm looking forward to, to seeing what you guys come up with. Uh, good night, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Night, everyone.